Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this privilege and freedom that we have to gather together freely without fear to open your word, the Holy Bible, to study it together and to fellowship and also have the freedom to share these things with others. As we look this morning at this topic of the Godhead, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to give us understanding and wisdom because we recognize that without your help, we cannot uh, understand anything about you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Once again, the full title this morning is What the Bible Says About the Godhead and Why It Matters, right? If we don't know why a doctrine or a teaching in the Bible matters, then uh, it's not going to be something that we probably spend much time studying. But I would suggest this morning, in fact, I'm, I'm very convicted that everything that God reveals in the Bible matters. Otherwise, he wouldn't have taken the space or wasted our time in trying to communicate useless trivia. Amen. So, what does the Bible say about the Godhead and why does it matter? I'm actually going to start this morning outside of the Bible. And I want to share with you briefly what the ancient pagan world was like in their beliefs regarding the gods. So here is a statue looking at some of the Hindu gods. And depending whom you ask, Hinduism either believes in one god that is expressed in all of the various gods that all the religions have, or there can be dozens of gods or thousands, or some will even say millions of gods in Hinduism. One number I saw on the internet was 333 million. And I think that's a pretty old number, but it was based on, at some point, Centuries ago, where they believed that there were 333 million people. So today it would be billions of gods, right? The Mayans believed in at least 200 gods and goddesses, as did the Aztecs, all in uh, South and Central America. The ancient Assyrians believed in four primary gods, but they had a pantheon of thousands of lesser gods. It would be really difficult to keep track of all of these different gods, right? And keep in mind that in the the pagan mindset, there would be a God that would either control a certain part of the world or of nature or that would reside or assert over a certain geographic area. So this is one reason why there were so many gods in their worldview. Because everywhere you went, there would be a new God with a new set of rules, a new set of things that you had to do or not do. And it would become very, very confusing and uh, produce a lot of fear as well. If we go to ancient Egypt, the Egyptians uh, had a very uh, complex view of religion, and they had at least 2,000 gods and goddesses that they served. Now, one of the things that we see as we look at some of these myths and mythologies connected with these ancient pagan religions is that the gods were constantly fighting each other. And in many ways, they reflected the very worst of what we find in humanity. So, for example, Osiris, you've probably heard his name, god of the underworld in ancient Egypt, was supposedly murdered by his brother Seth. And uh, then you have some other gods in ancient Egypt, Horus, who was the son of Isis and Osiris. Uh, supposedly, Horus was raised to avenge his father's murder. And one tradition holds that Horus lost his left eye while fighting with Seth, but his eye was magically healed by the god Thoth. So you have this, this fighting and this war that is constantly taking place. Now you may recognize at least this style of artwork. This is a, a drawing of the Greek gods and the pantheon of gods here. And the ancient Romans adopted much of what they inherited from Greece. And so both in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, you had this pantheon of gods. Greece was interesting, obviously very ancient civilization as well. They believed in uh, 12, no, I don't know how many, pre primordial deities, the first one being named Chaos. And you actually find a reflection of that in the Bible, don't you? The description there in Genesis 1 verse 2, before God begins his work of creation, the water's just kind of swirling around chaotically here on earth. Well, the ancient Greeks believed that eventually those primordial deities gave way to the 12 titans who then eventually were replaced with these 12 um, Olympians who had children and many, many grandchildren. This was another 
uh, feature or, or way that the ancients viewed these gods and goddesses is that they would constantly be having more children and offspring. And so one god would produce another. Uh, not that they were all from eternity past, as the Bible tells us. Rome had more than 60 divine beings with 12 main gods. <clears throat> Quickly here, uh, the main Greek god was Zeus. The Romans renamed him Jupiter. And according to this mythology, Zeus's father, Kronos, learned that one of his children was fated to dethrone him as leader of the gods. So he ate each one as soon as they were born. Okay, constant violence in the ancient pagan world. When Zeus grew up, he forced Kronos to throw up his brothers and sisters, and he waged war on his father, and then he won. Another Greek goddess, Athena. Athena is the Greek goddess of reason, handicraft, wisdom, and war. She is the daughter of Zeus, and according to legend, spring fully grown from his forehead, dressed in armor. And I can't even show you the statues of Hera because it wouldn't be appropriate for our group here today. But uh, supposedly she is the wife and sister of Zeus, queen of the gods. Although she is often depicted as reserved and calm, she repeatedly sought revenge for Zeus's many affairs with mortal and immortal women, punishing them and their offspring. Again, the worst of what we see in humanity was reflected in the characters and the actions of these ancient pagan gods. Now we'll look at one more culture, that is ancient Babylon. And I'm going to read for you a few paragraphs. This is a summary of the Babylonian creation myth, Enuma Elish. The story, one of the oldest in the world, concerns the birth of the gods and the creation of the universe and human beings. In the beginning, there was only undifferentiated water swirling in chaos. Out of this swirl, the waters divided into sweet, fresh water known as the god Apsu and salty, bitter water, the goddess Tiamat. Once differentiated, the union of these two entities gave birth to all of the younger gods. These young gods, however, were extremely loud, troubling the sleep of Apsu at night and distracting him from his work by day. Upon the advice of his vizier named Mumu, Apsu decides to kill the younger gods. Tiamat, hearing of their plan, warns her eldest son, Enki, and he puts Apsu to sleep and kills him. From Apsu's remains, Enki creates his home. More violence, right? Tiamat, once the supporter of the younger gods, now is enraged that they have killed her mate. She consults with the god Quingu, who advises her to make war on the younger gods. Tiamat rewards Quingu with the tablets of destiny, which legitimize the rule of a god and control the fates, and he wears them proudly as a breastplate. With Quingu as her champion, Tiamat summons the forces of chaos and creates 11 horrible monsters to destroy her children. Ea, Inki, and the younger gods fight against Tiamat futilely until from among them emerges the champion Marduk. And you've probably heard that name, right? Ba uh, one of the gods of Babylon, who swears he will defeat Tiamut. Marduk defeats Quingu and kills Tiamat by shooting her with an arrow, which splits her in two. From her eyes flow the waters of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Out of her corpse, Marduk creates the heavens and the earth. He appoints gods to various duties and binds Tiamat's 11 creatures to his feet as trophies. He also takes the tablets of destiny from Quingu and thus legitimizes his reign. After the gods have finished praising him for his great victory and the art of his creation, Marduk consults with the god Ea and decides to create human beings from the remains of whichever of the gods encouraged Tiamat to make war. Quingu is charged as guilty and killed, and from his blood, Eu creates Lulu, the first man, to be a helper to the gods in their eternal task of maintaining order and keeping chaos at bay. You've had enough of that, right? Why did I go through this? Because I want you to understand how the ancients viewed their gods. And maybe I shouldn't qualify that by saying the ancients. Maybe we're not so different. How many people view the God of heaven in kind of the same way? Constant violence, fighting, changing of uh, attitudes toward each other, breaking promises, having affairs, seeking revenge. The worst of humanity reflected in these gods. And I've gone through this because I want you to understand the, the difference that this book, the Bible, 
portrays about the God of heaven. So what two things, if you're on your sheet, we'll just start working our way through it here. What two things does the Bible tell us about the God of heaven? Now, the Bible tells us many things about God. We're just going to focus on two. One of these would be this, one of the central things that Christianity has always said about God. The second thing we'll look at is probably the central passage that the ancient Jews and Hebrews used in their understanding of God. God is what? Love. Now, we have grown up in a Western, largely Christianized culture, and if you've gone to church and you've been a Christian, then you've grown up hearing this your whole life, right? God is love. But I want you to place yourself back in one of those pagan cultures where you believe the gods were like what we read about. And then you hear that there is a God that is what? Love. That's very, very different, isn't it? What does it even mean? 1 John 4, 8, He that loveth knoweth not God, for God is love. The Bible tells us that God is the source of love. And that without a revelation of God's love, we cannot even understand what love is. Now, the Greek word, and you've heard this word, is agape. There are different words for love in Greek, but the one used here in 1 John 4, 8, the, the, uh, the Greek word used in John 3, verse 16, where God so loved the world, that's agape. And agape is a uniquely biblical word that is not found in secular Greek authors. You just don't find that form of the word love. It's only in the biblical literature that we find it. One commentary says the noun for love is scarcely found in Greek before the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And a common traditional argument for this suggested that the word was coined by that version and was thus the supreme example of a word that was developed within the revealed religion. In other words, the Greeks had no concept for self-sacrificing benevolent love. That's what agape means. It did not even exist in their language until the Old Testament was translated into Greek. And the word was coined uh, or almost created to express these ideas that were completely foreign to the pagan mindset of a God that agapes everything he has created. Now, if you look at the way agape was understood by the early Christians, you've heard of, of agape feasts, right? This goes all the way back to the early Christian church where they would come together not just for the communion service, but they would have a meal as well. And even today, we sometimes do this. We'll have an agape meal, usually a simple meal, and it's often followed by communion. And as far as we can tell, this is, was not uncommon in the early church. But, but here was the deal. Why was it called the agape feast? Because it was a, a time or a place, a setting, where the wealthy Christians would provide for those that didn't have as much. And so they would pay for the food. They would, they would provide, and it was a time where benevolence could be exercised within the Christian community. Here's, here's the point. You cannot agape yourself. You have to agape somebody else, right? Benevolence toward yourself isn't really benevolence. It's just selfish interest. And so when the Bible says that God is love or God is agape, the word itself means that God is showering his love or his care or his protection or his benevolence on somebody else, on something else. Now, certainly that's true of his creation. The Bible tells us that God not only created us, but he continues to provide for us. But if you go back far enough in time, there were no created beings, and yet God existed, right? our minds start to get a headache when we try to understand these aspects of eternity. But at some point in the past, there was only God, because only He is immortal. But even at that point in time, God was still agape. So who was He agapeing before He created somebody? This is one of the clues we have that the Godhead is more than just one individual. 
because God could not be love if it was just himself. Now, the second passage arises from the Old Testament that reveals to us the God of the Bible, and that is that God is one. We're going to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. So in what ways is the God of heaven, the God of the Bible, one compared to all of these pagan pantheons that we were looking at? Let me suggest a few ways. God is one in origin. Again, these ancient mythologies of the pagan gods, this God would have this son or daughter, and then just like we have in human society, right? There's generations that follow, and you have grandchildren gods. Well, the Bible says God is one in origin. God is one in character, and that character never changes. That's different than the pagan gods. God is one in purpose, and that purpose never changes. Again, very different from the pagan deities. God is one in action. He is one in consistency. He is one in self-sacrificing love. Doesn't God say in the Bible, I change not? Right? Now, let's look a little more closely at this word in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, that is translated as one. It is what uh, Hebrew scholars tell us is a compound unity. So the Hebrew word you can see there is ihad, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And it literally means united or first or alike. There is another Hebrew word that means literal number one, like the numeral one that we think of. But that's not the word that's used here. The word that's used, and there's a variation of it, uh, you can see right beneath, ahad, uh, means something very similar. It means to unite or to join oneself together or to collect oneself. So when we read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, grammatically, it doesn't have to mean there is only one being that is God. It means that the Godhead that the Bible speaks of is united together. They are one in character, one in purpose. They have collected themselves together, and our human minds can't fully understand this, how it can be one God and yet three beings. There are other Bible verses that use this word. I've listed some of them on your sheet as well. In Genesis 1 verse 5, the morning and the evening are the first day or the ehad day. Okay? That means two things come together to create a unity. In Genesis 2 verse 24, Adam and Eve become one flesh. Same Hebrew word. Does that mean that Adam and Eve actually literally became one body? Of course not. It means they were joined together, and they were unified, uh, and they should never be separated. Genesis 11, verse 6, when God comes down to look at the Tower of Babel, God said of the Babel builders that the people are one, same Hebrew word. Of course, that doesn't mean there was only one literal person building the Tower of Babel. They were united together in purpose, weren't they? They had one language as well. In Genesis 34, verse 16, the Shechemites tell Jacob's sons that they will become one people with the Israelites if they will allow them to marry uh, Jacob's daughters. One more example in Genesis 41, 25, where Joseph is explaining Pharaoh's two dreams to him. And Joseph tells Pharaoh that his dreams are one, ihad. That means they are united. We know Pharaoh had two dreams but they meant the same thing. They were united in their message and in their purpose why God sent them. Now again, you can contrast those Hebrew words with uh, yahid or yakid, which is the other Hebrew word that literally means one thing or one person. In Genesis 22 verse 2, that word is used when God tells Abraham to go and sacrifice thine only son, Isaac. That means literally You're only one, the one there. So there is a difference here. And when we see in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, that hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord, grammatically it's pointing to the fact that there is a unity within the Godhead. There are only three verses in the King James Version 
where we find the word Godhead or the title Godhead. And I, I did a short search online. Um, in the New King James Version, you actually find it in only two of those verses. And then there was only one or two other translations where the word Godhead even appears. You get the newer translations, they don't even use the word Godhead. So it really is kind of a King James term. Um, but it always is pointing to deity or divinity or the status of being divine. So let's look at those three verses. The first one is our scripture for today, Acts chapter 17 and verse 29. Acts chapter 17 and verse 29. Paul, of course, is speaking here. He says, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. What is Paul trying to say here? God is so far above human comprehension. The Godhead is so far above us that we cannot comprehend who he is or who the Godhead really is. And of course, there's the obvious warning here as well, which we find in the second commandment, do not try to portray God or the Godhead in your drawings or your carvings or your statues that we find in all of the pagan religions. So Ellen White had something to say about this. <clears throat> There's a couple of paragraphs here, but uh, I believe they're important. I'm instructed to say the sentiments of those who are searching for advanced scientific ideas are not to be trusted. Such representations as the following are made. The Father is as the light invisible, the Son is as the light embodied, the Spirit is the light shed abroad. Or the Father is like the dew in visible vapor, the Son is like the dew gathered in beauty's form, the Spirit is like the dew fallen to the seed of life. Another representation. The Father is like the invisible vapor, the Son is like the leaden cloud, the Spirit is rain fallen and working in refreshing power. Then she says this. All these spiritualistic representations are simply nothingness. They are imperfect and untrue. They weaken and diminish the majesty which no earthly likeness can be compared to. God cannot be compared with the things his hands have made. These are mere earthly things suffering under the curse of God because of the sins of man. The Father cannot be described by the things of earth. The Father is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and is invisible to mortal sight. The Son is all the fullness of the Godhead manifested. The Word of God declares Him to be the express image of His person. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here is shown the personality of the Father. Reading on. The Comforter that Christ promised to send after He ascended to heaven is the Spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead making manifest the power of divine grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as a personal Savior. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized, and these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. Now, that's a pretty lengthy statement. But I hope you understand the point that she's trying to make. We cannot understand really who God is, who the Godhead is. We will never be able to fully understand, and I would say even through eternity, we will never fully understand the nature of God or the nature of the relationship between the members of the Godhead. And the Bible doesn't expect us to. God is not holding us accountable to fully understand this because he has not revealed it to us. What he does expect us to do is to accept what the Bible has revealed and to place our faith in him, that he is working for our salvation. So that's the first passage, Acts chapter 17, verse 29. The second passage is Romans chapter 1, verse 20. So let's read that. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, <clears throat> what um, Paul is saying here 
is that if we want to understand God and the Godhead better, right? Not perfectly, not completely, but if we want to better understand, then we need to look at creation. And we're going to do that in just a moment. We'll go back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2. We'll look at creation and see what it tells us about the Godhead. But first, let's look at the third verse where we find the reference or the name Godhead, the title Godhead. And that's Colossians 2 verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This is in reference to Jesus Christ. So again, the message is clear. If we want to understand God better, then we need to look at Jesus Christ. We need to look at his life. And we'll do that in the final part of our study today. So let's go to Genesis, chapters 1 and 2. Romans 1 verse 20 said that creation can help us to better understand who God is. So how is the Godhead revealed at creation? We'll look at a few passages in these opening chapters. Beginning with the first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, a lot could be said about these verses, but let's start with this. The fourth word in the Bible, at least in our English translations, is the word God, isn't it? In the beginning, God. The Hebrew word there is Elohim, and you've heard that name as a title of God before. Elohim is interesting. It's, it's an interesting Hebrew word because grammatically it is a plural word, but it's used as if it were singular. So even in the word itself, we find at least a dim reflection of a three-in-one concept, a plural word, but used in the singular. That is, the, the adjectives and the uh, verbs that surround it are often singular, even though the noun itself is a plural noun. This name of God in the Old Testament, Elohim, is used over 2,000 times. Sometimes we do find El. That's singular. And there are many, many names in the Bible that use that as part of the name. Think of Daniel, right? dan -yel. Dan means judgment. El means God. So that's why Daniel's name means either God of judgment or God is my judge. And many, many Hebrew names had E-L somewhere in it. Mishael, right? Daniel. There's many others. That's the singular form. But when we find it as a title of God or a name of God, it's in the plural, Elohim. One um, uh, commentary, this is Jacinius's Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, says this. In imitation of the Aramean usage, the singular form is only used in poetry and in the later Hebrew, but the plural of majesty, and referring to Elohim, occurs more than 2,000 times. We find this as a name of God many, many times throughout the Old Testament. Now, if you look at these three verses that open the Holy Scriptures, there is something interesting as uh, Moses is trying to relate to us uh, more about the God that created everything. In verse 1, we have reference to God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, in verse 2, we find reference to the Spirit of God, don't we? The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And in verse 3, we find out something that God does. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. There is a reference here to the three members of the Godhead. You have God the Father as the source of action, the one who says, we're going to do this in verse 1. In verse 2, you have the Holy Spirit who is uh, very involved in bringing about the will of God. And then in verse 3, you have the Word of God, don't you? And in the Gospel of John, that gospel begins in the first three verses by explaining that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it goes on to reveal to us that it is the Word of God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that was another active participant in the work of creation. So the first three verses of the Bible 
revealed to us, at least in a small, albeit maybe shadowy way, that there is a Godhead involved in creation. Let's look at another passage in Genesis chapter 1. This is the creation of mankind, day number 6. Verse 26, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now again, there's lots of interesting things packed in these verses here. At the beginning of verse 26, God speaks. And he says, let us make man or mankind... In our image, obviously there's plural uh, pronouns being used here. And uh, as you look back at some of the commentaries over the centuries, uh, and even some of the Jewish and Hebrew writings earlier, they were struggling to understand, okay, who is the us that's being referred to? Some said, well, maybe God is speaking to the angels, right? Um, Or something else that's out there. But in verse 27, it says, So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him. So God couldn't be speaking to the angels or to any created entity at the beginning of verse 26, where he says, Let us make man in our image. Because verse 27 says that we are created in God's image, not the image of God and the angels. So it seems clear that in verse 26, when God says, let us make man in our image, this is a conversation between the members of the Godhead. And that's again confirmed in verse 27. So God created mankind or humanity in his image. In the image of God created he him. Now look at this. Here is a compound unity again. He created humanity how? Male and female. Referred to as one. Referred to as man or humanity, but there are two parts that make up that image of God. This is from uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary. The plural us was regarded by the early church as indicative of the three persons of the Godhead. The word us requires the presence of at least two persons counseling together. The statements that man was to be made in our image and was made in God's image leads to the conclusion that those counseling must both be persons of the same Godhead. We are therefore justified in declaring that the first evidence for the sublime mystery of the Godhead is found on the first page of the Bible, a mystery that is placed in clearer light as the pen of inspiration of the different authors of the Bible books was moved to reveal this truth more fully. Now at the end of chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, we have that first marriage ceremony where God brings Adam and Eve together. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be, what? One flesh. There's that same Hebrew word we were talking about earlier. This compound unity. In God's sight, the two, when they are united together in purpose and in in action, become one, a reflection of who God is. Next question, what does the Bible suggest about the Godhead and the Sabbath? Turn to Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. That should be verses 2 and 3 on the screen. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now be honest with me, how many of you have found this passage a little bit challenging to memorize? I have at least. And one of the reasons is because it repeats some things more than once. What does this passage repeat? There are several things mentioned three times in this passage. If you look at it closely, we find God or Elohim is mentioned three times in these two verses. We find that the work God created and made is mentioned three times. Three times it says that God worked or created. The fact that God ended his work or rested from his work is also mentioned three times in these two verses. 
And finally, the seventh day is mentioned three times. And my question is, why would that be? Why would God repeat this information three times? A reference to Elohim three times. The fact that Elohim created three times. The fact that he rested three times. And why would we find three references to the seventh day Sabbath? Well, it is possible, of course, that God is just repeating this so that we get it, right? So that we understand the importance of it. That's certainly part of it. But it could also be because there is a connection between the Sabbath and the Godhead that God does not want us to miss. You see, the seventh day Sabbath is more than just one day of the week, isn't it? We understand that. That's why we're here today. God blessed and he sanctified that day for a specific purpose. And there are many verses in the Bible that tell us what that is. One of those is Ezekiel 12, verse 20. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that what? Sanctifies them. The seventh day Sabbath is God's chosen sign of his power to sanctify us, to forgive us, and to wash us clean from sin. Now, is it just the Father that does that work? Is it just God the Son that's involved in sanctification? Or maybe it's only the Holy Spirit and the other two said, eh, we're not going to get messed up in that, you, you handle it. No, clearly, it's all three, isn't it? And so perhaps this is why we find those three references to God in Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. Then maybe this is why we find three references that God created, three references that he stopped or rested from his work of creation, and three references to the seventh day Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is not just a day of rest. It should be a vital connection between us and the God who created us and saved us and promises to transform us. Interesting statement here from Spirit of Prophecy. This is Signs of the Times, June 19. 1901. Our sanctification is the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is the fulfillment of the covenant that God has made with those who bind themselves up with Him, to stand with Him, with His Son, and with His Spirit in holy fellowship. Have you been born again? Have you become a new being in Christ Jesus? Then cooperate with the three great powers of heaven who are working in your behalf. Doing this, you will reveal to the world the principles of righteousness. That's a beautiful statement, isn't it? And it connects the Godhead with the plan of salvation, with the Sabbath, with his promise that we can live forever with him in heaven. Next question. How is the Godhead revealed in Jesus Christ's life? I will move a little more quickly through some of these points here. But if we look at... Well, let me start with this statement from Review and Herald, May 2, 1912. The Godhead was stirred with pity for the race, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit gave themselves to the working out of the plan of redemption. In order fully to carry out this plan, it was decided that Christ, the only begotten Son of God, would give himself an offering for sin. So was it just the Son of God that gave himself so that we could be saved? Did the Father also give something? Clearly he did, didn't he? How about the Holy Spirit? Again, this statement says that all three gave themselves to the working out of the plan of redemption. So let's see how this is revealed more fully in the life of Christ. We can go to the incarnation. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. We find reference to all three members of the Godhead in this verse. The Father gives his Son. Christ gives himself. The Holy Spirit gives Jesus in birth through Mary. They're all giving of themselves for our redemption. We can go to the baptism at the Jordan River, Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. 
And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Obvious references there to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit involved in this most important part of Christ's ministry, his baptism as well. The Father is giving encouragement, isn't he? This voice from heaven. Jesus, again, is giving himself to be baptized, and the Holy Spirit gives himself to Jesus to empower him. Luke chapter 4, verse 1 says that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit as he went into the wilderness for the temptation and as he continues his ministry. He didn't do it on his own power as a human being. He was full of the Holy Spirit. We come to the closing scenes of Christ's life. And Jesus is speaking to his disciples in John chapter 16, just before his arrest and crucifixion. And he says in verses 13 and 15, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Again, we find references to all three members of the Godhead still at work for our salvation as we near those closing scenes of Christ's life. The Father gives all that he has. Christ lays down his life. And the Spirit continues to give himself to guide us so that we can recognize and accept Christ's sacrifice. Let's end by looking at a couple of passages in the book of Revelation. How is the Godhead revealed in Revelation? And more than any other verses that we've looked at, this would apply to us today, wouldn't it? Where are we today? In Revelation 12, verse 17, we find a description of the remnant church at the end of time. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep what? The commandments of God. And they have what else? The testimony of Jesus Christ. So here we have reference to the Father and His commandments. We find reference to the Son and the testimony that Jesus Christ has. And you're probably familiar with Revelation 19, verse 10, which says the testimony of Jesus is what? The spirit of prophecy. So here we have, again, all three members of the Godhead involved in God's church at the end of time. And I say praise the Lord for that. Because God's remnant church has been given a mission that it can never accomplish on its own power, and only through the help of God. What about the message that has been given to the remnant church? We find that in Revelation 14, verses 12 and 13. So let's read those verses. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Again, all three members of the Godhead at work in this message, the three angels' message, that we have been given to share with the world. Now, when we place ourselves on God's side, when we make that decision, to associate ourselves with the remnant church of Revelation. The Bible warns us in Revelation 12, verse 17, that there is an enemy who will be very angry with you. Right? The dragon was what? Wroth. We don't use that word wroth. That's an old English word. But it doesn't just mean frustrated. And it doesn't mean irritated. It means red in the face, fists clenched, and my fist is moving toward you type of anger. And he goes to make war with the remnant of her seed. Not only is the devil angry with us as we place our lives on God's side, but he's angry with God himself, isn't he? That's where the war began. And the devil is angry with the Father, and he's angry with the Son, and he's angry with the Holy Spirit. And so the war is not only against us, but it is against God, and it's against this Godhead that the Bible reveals to us is giving themselves 
for our redemption and the work of our salvation. I'm thankful that we have a God who is unlike all of the pagan gods that humanity has invented. Because quite frankly, those gods are straight from the inspiration of the devil, aren't they? The devil knows that if we can keep our eyes or our minds focused or we live in fear of that kind of God, then we over time become like that God, lowercase g. And he tries, and he has done this so successfully through history, he has tried to keep humanity focused on that kind of God because he knows that if we focus on the true God, we will eventually be transformed into his likeness as well. How many of you want to be transformed more and more into the divine nature as the Holy Spirit dwells in you, as you develop a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and as that power in your life enables you to live in obedience to the Father's commandments? God promises that he'll do it. And I know that every single one of us here has a testimony we can share about the changes that God has made in your life up to this point, and praise God for that. We need more testimonies, don't we? We need a testimony that continues from this day forward until Jesus comes back. We need a continual relationship and experience with the God who has given everything to save us. And he has promised that we can have that kind of relationship with him if we seek him with all of our heart.